This is BBC One, now the BBC News with Clive Myrie. King Charles and the Prince of Wales greet mourners queuing for hours to see the Queen's lying in state. They thank those waiting through the night to get into Westminster Hall before the state funeral on Monday. Oh, you look well dressed for it. Good, oh, yeah. good, good, good trainers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, it means an awful lot you are here. Really does. Thank, Thank you so yeah. much. Yes. The accessible queue has now closed and there's a warning the general queue will shut well before the funeral service. The line currently stretches back five miles. Next week, the Queen's coffin will be transferred to Westminster Abbey for her funeral, led by the Dean of Westminster. Right at the heart of this is a family funeral. We mustn't forget that. Uh, deeply personal um, and, uh, and a, very, a very difficult thing for a family to navigate. But this is also a celebration of a quite extraordinary life. This evening, the Queen's eight grandchildren, including Princes William and Harry, will hold a vigil by their grandmother's coffin. Also on the programme. Ukraine says more Western weaponry is needed to beat the Russians as bodies are recovered from a mass burial site newly liberated in northeastern Ukraine. Hundreds protest outside New Scotland Yard over the shooting dead of the unarmed black man, Chris Cabba. And football pays tribute to the Queen in the first full weekend of fixtures since her death. Good afternoon. The King and the Prince of Wales have been meeting members of the public queuing in London to see the Queen's lying in state. They thank those waiting through the night to get into Westminster Hall before the state funeral on Monday. Others hoping to pay their respects have been warned the general queue could be closed again today if there are too many people. The waiting time is currently around 11 hours with long lines stretching five miles along the River Thames to Southwark Park. This evening, in Westminster Hall, the Queen's eight grandchildren, including Princes William and Harry, will hold a vigil by the coffin. With more on the day's events, here's our Royal Correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. Neither of them is a newcomer to this, yet for both of them, Charles and William, there's a special intensity just at the moment. When you get in there, it is very emotional. Partly because of the emotions which are so in evidence but also because of their new roles. Here is the man who is now king, and the man who is now next in line to the throne. Both Charles and William have a natural warmth, appreciated today by people who'd queued through a cold night to reach the lying in state. This, clearly, was a supportive crowd. No one needed to be won over. But watch the interactions with the king. The handshakes tended to linger a little. And arms were patted. It was a brief moment of personal contact, not always helped by the ever-present mobile phones. Both the King and his son wanted to know how people were coping with the long wait. You look like you're dressed by a rucksack on, doing, you know, read the manual. Okay. <laughs> So this team have been managing what we call Sector 2. Just before the walkabout, the King had visited one of the main control rooms where the Metropolitan Police is coordinating the immense operation being mounted by all the emergency services. Possibly the biggest such operation London has ever seen. And then this afternoon at Buckingham Palace, a meeting with representatives of the other countries where the British monarch remains the head of state. Australia, Canada, New Zealand and countries in the Caribbean. Some are already reviewing their links with the British Crown. Decisions on that are for the future. Their priority now is to pay their tributes to their Queen. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau visited the lying in state. Another visitor was Australia's Anthony Albanese, who's known to favour Australia becoming a republic. 
But a time of mourning is no time for politics. Westminster Hall continues to be a place where citizens of the British nation and others pay their respects. Very soon the Queen's grandsons and granddaughters, led by the Prince of Wales, will take their turn to stand in vigil around the Queen's coffin. Nick, you mentioned there a slight sort of longer lingering of the of the king with some of those he greeted today. Are we seeing a different style compared to the Queen? One thing they all hate, Clive, is those mobile phones being thrust in their face. Yes, each monarch brings something of their own personality to the role. The Queen had her personal style. It was a product of her personality and of the generation of which she was a part, and it was hugely successful, respected around the world. Now, Charles is a, a rather more, shall we say, demonstrative and outgoing personality. It's always been his style, but it is now, if you like, the style of the man who literally and metaphorically wears the crown. And I think we should not confuse style with substance. Charles does have a different style, but the substance, the performance of the role of the monarchy will remain the same. Charles has made it very clear uh, in several of his speeches that he will follow the example set by his mother. So some change in style, but not in terms of the fundamentals. Sure. Okay. Nick, many thanks. Nick Witchell there. Well, in the last hour, the accessible queue has been closed. After reaching capacity, the general queue remains open for now, with the lying in state ending early Monday morning. Our correspondent Chichi Yuzundu has been chatting to some of those paying their respects. The pomp and the ceremony, and a personal royal thank you for the hours stood in the cold. You look well, you look well dressed for it. Good, oh, yeah. good, good trainers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good jackets. Well, that means an awful lot you were here. It really does. You could tell you the pain he was suffering. And he just basically said, bless you, thank you. Overnight, one after the other, thousands continued to queue. Anyone else got a blanket? Yep, thanks very much. A cold night, a long walk, and free blankets. Creative measures being used to relieve the boredom. We've been queuing for 13 hours. How's it been? Very dull. <laughs> <laughs> it's been quite hard, hasn't it? Yeah. Chilly at times. Can I see your yellow wristband, please? Also out in the cold, standing for hours. Army, police, volunteers, scouts. Take one. Thank Take you. one. Thank you. Something which touched naval scout Oliver. How proud are you of your colleagues that have volunteered? Very, very proud. Very, 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 very proud. It's just, you know, it's just, they're just amazing. They, they kind of bring all the spirits for people because obviously it's a long night, you know, 12 o'clock I started last night. So, yeah, it's a very good night. It's been tiring, but it's been fine. It's been good banter and um, queue's been moving. I'm tired. Oh, my feet are absolutely tired. After all the waiting, the moment to pay their respects. She was our queen for 70 years. The most amazing woman who did everything until her last, you know, dying days. Oh, I loved her crown. I thought all the diamonds and stuff on it were amazing. Emotional, really emotional. That's, um, I won't forget that. I'm really glad we persevered as well. It was chilly in the night and it would have been easy to give up and I'm so glad now that we didn't. I'm really proud of you. <laughs> Do you feel like you did your duty to say goodbye to the Queen? I hope so, yes. What's the plan now? I think a big cup of tea, a piece of cake and home. <laughs> and bed. <laughs> yeah. So whilst it's a good night to Sam and Florence, for thousands more, the wait continues. Chichi Zindu, BBC News. Well, our correspondent Jonathan Blake is at the end of the queue in Southwark in South East London. Jonathan, are people still joining the line? 
They certainly are, Clive. It has been a beautiful sunny day here in southeast London and all day there has been a steady stream of people joining the queue here in Southwark Park to begin what will be a very memorable experience, no doubt, but certainly a very tiring one as well. That long wait time not putting people off in the slightest. And we can have a quick word with a couple of people now who joined the queue about half an hour ago. Lanry, Felix, how are you feeling? Great, great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to, you know, making this pilgrimage. You've got a long night ahead. Are you well prepared? Uh, yes, we're prepared. We've brought lots of things with us. <laughs> okay, and what do you think it'll be like to file past the Queen's Coffin? Um, I, I think it's going to be great, um, overwhelming. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's such a huge moment. Um, the Queen has been a monumental figure in um, the, 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 the lives of every single one of us. Mm -hmm and I think this is the least we could do okay. um, just to pay our last respects. All right, we'll let you get on and join the queue. Thank you very much for stopping. Just two of the many, many thousands of people who are still joining the queue at the end of this third full day of lying in state of the Queen. And it seems the queue has become part of the experience for people. But of course, that opportunity, as you were hearing there, to file past the Queen's coffin is in Westminster Hall, is the draw for so many people. But for those joining the queue and, and filing past us here in Southwark Park this evening, it'll be well into the early early hours of the morning uh, before they reach Westminster Hall. OK, Jonathan, thank you, Jonathan Blake, there, live in South East London. And uh, if you can't get to London, but you want to pay your respects, the BBC is offering a continuous 24-hour view of the Queen's lying in state. The service is available on the BBC homepage, the BBC News website and app, the iPlayer on BBC Parliament, and the red button. Well, the Queen's lying in state will end at 6.30 on Monday morning. Then, at 10.44, her coffin will be moved from Westminster Hall, a short distance away, to Westminster Abbey, where her state funeral service will be held. The Royal Navy's state gun carriage seen here in rehearsals will bear the coffin driven by a hundred, drawn by 142 sailors, senior members of the royal family, including the new king and his sons, Prince William and Prince Harry, will walk just behind in the procession. Then at 11 o'clock, the Queen's funeral, expected to be attended by 2,000 guests, will begin with the service led by the very Reverend Dr. David Hoyle, and he's been speaking to my colleague, Rita Chakrabarti. Leading the Queen's state funeral on Monday is a momentous task for Dr. David Hoyle. He says he seeks to balance formal mourning and private grief. Right at the heart of this is a family funeral. We mustn't forget that. Uh, deeply personal um, and, uh, and a, very, a very difficult thing for a family to navigate. But this is also a celebration of a quite extraordinary life. Uh, this is an opportunity for us all to mourn, all to remember. And this is also a place for a bit of hope. That's the job of the church. And what about the Queen's own personal links with the Abbey? They were profound. I, I point out from time to time that uh, this is the place where she took the promises that defined her life. So this is the place where she married in 1947 and she made, she made those promises that sustained that extraordinary public marriage that they, they then lived out. And this is the place where she took her coronation oaths. So the Abbey shaped her life. Uh, I, I met her on a number of occasions uh, uh, occasionally. She talked about the Abbey with great affection and she talked about what had happened here. And what about your own personal feelings about leading the funeral ceremony. Are you nervous? <laughs> um, if I sit still for too long uh, and start thinking about uh, the significance of the moment and, and the eyes that are on you, then yes, honestly, of course I am. Um, there's, a, there's a huge sense of privilege. I mean, what an extraordinary place to be at a moment like this. Uh, there's a bit of a sense of responsibility. Uh, I also have around me uh, a quite wonderful group of people. Uh, so uh, this place steps up on these occasions. Um, it will be fine. <laughs> and at the end of it all, what would you like people to be able to take away from it? I think 
we need to recollect this is a state funeral. So this, this really is something that is intended to be seen. It's very visual. Um, it's also intended to be heard. I, I think one of the things we are trying to do uh, is to take all that emotion, uh, all that interest, uh, all that care uh, that we can see in the queue for the lying in state, that we can see uh, in the parks where people are laying flowers, and feel that we have managed in the Abbey uh, to provide a focus for that. We've, we've put it into words, we've given the grief somewhere to go. Dr. Hall, thank you very much. A indeed. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. The very Reverend uh, there, Dr. David Hoyle, speaking to my colleague Rita Chakrabarti. Well, some are still preparing to travel to London from across the country for the Queen's funeral on Monday. Our correspondent Lakshmi Kobal has been uh, speaking to some of those making plans for the journey. Preparing for a pilgrimage by getting kitted out for camping. I've got a couple of jumpers. Uh, I've got a nice blanket as well. Alex Bray is leaving his bedroom in Home Firth in West Yorkshire to head to the streets of London with a tent to pay his respects to the Queen. Hi Johnny, are you all right? He and his brother Jonathan will set off at five in the morning and stay until after the state funeral on Monday. After so long, it's just nice to say kind of a proper goodbye and, and be part of the atmosphere as well. It's going to be sad, but I think it's going to be a real sense of unity. Hi Mum. They'll be joining their mother, Alison, who's already made the journey down to see the Queen lying in state. Why was it important for you to all be there as a family? She's brought so many generations together. She's brought my family together. You know, my grandma's got spe special memories. My mum's got special memories. I've got special memories. And, and to be there together as a family, just seeing that moment will mean a lot. As many people across the country to come together, be it brothers, be it fam family, be it friends, and again, as a community, to be together as one. The Queen's power to transcend generations lives on in her death. The Richmond family from Rugby drove down early to London so their children could lay flowers. Willow was quite affected by it. She is very taken with the Queen and her handbags and her dresses. I'm happy and sad and I'm excited to go and see the Queen. By car, by coach, by rail, the capital continues to swell with people from around the country, making their way to be part of this moment in history, including these lifelong friends from Manchester. We're going to see ABBA and then straight from ABBA we're going to join the queues and pay our respects to the Queen. Even those not travelling can be part of shared grieving. In the Aberdeenshire fishing village of Gurdon, this pub will be showing Monday's proceedings on screen, one of many community screenings of the funeral around the country. It's a large wake and yeah, we're just inviting the locals to come in and take part in, in this experience because no one really in the last 70 years has experienced anything like this, so it's going to be something new for all of us. Rituals have always been an important part of monarchy and of mourning. For Alex, like for so many, the way to process the death of the Queen is by joining others to grieve and to reflect together. Lakshmi Gopal, BBC News. To other news now, and Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says investigations into possible Russian war crimes are continuing in the northeastern city of Izum. Several bodies have already been exhumed from a mass burial site on the edge of the city, which was recently retaken from Russian forces. Ukrainian officials say more than 440 people are buried there. Izum is just one of several areas recently liberated by Ukrainian forces. However, heavy fighting is continuing in the areas circled here. Our correspondent James Waterhouse has the latest from the capital, Kiev. Ukraine is as determined to document as it is to fight. In Izum, liberation has turned more bitter than sweet. Hundreds of bodies, now a dossier of evidence over claims of Russian war crimes. All uncovered after a series of Ukrainian counter-offensives in the northeast. In newly released footage, what Russia wants to say is that their plans have not changed. As they look to hit back, the US had this warning if chemical or nuclear weapons were being considered. Don't. 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 It will change the face of war, unlike anything since World War II.
What is never altered is the enduring human cost of this war. Alexander Shapoval performed as a ballet dancer for 28 seasons at the Kiev Opera House before volunteering to fight for Ukraine. This week, he was killed in a mortar strike in the east. Alexander was a very beautiful person. There's not a single person in the theater who wouldn't love Alexander. He was a talented artist and an incredibly kind person. He could not not go and defend his family, friends and all Ukrainians. What this is, is a combination of grief and pride, not just of Alexander's accomplishments in the Opera House, but because of the cause he died for. And that's the point. Ukraine has always known why it was fighting and the price it was willing to pay. It's hard to imagine another escalation in a conflict already full of incomprehensible pain. James Waterhouse, BBC News in Kiev. Hundreds of people have gathered outside New Scotland Yard in London to protest the shooting dead of an unarmed black man earlier this month. Many of the demonstrators carried placards bearing pictures of Chris Cabber, who was 24. His family has accused the Metropolitan Police of racism and the police watchdog is carrying out an investigation. Our correspondent Celestina Olulode has that story. Tender love and support for a family that continued to grieve. A shared trauma for which they are demanding answers. Did the officers know that it was Chris in the car, or were they simply following a suspect vehicle? The suspended officer must be interviewed under caution, without delay, and keep family informed of this. There should be a charging decision within weeks and not months. Chris Cabber was fatally shot by a Metropolitan Police officer on the 5th of September. He was unarmed. Police say the car he was driving was linked to a previous firearms incident. The vehicle was not registered to Mr. Kaba. His family say he was borrowing the car from a friend. The officer that fired the fatal shot has been suspended. An investigation has been launched by the Independent Office for Police Conduct. The Met says it supports the investigation. Well, the police watchdog says it must explore all the circumstances surrounding Mr. Cabba's death, including how officers came to be aware of the vehicle Mr. Cabba was driving. The investigation is expected to take six to nine months, a time frame people here say is much too long. Celestina Olulode, BBC News. The Metropolitan Police has confirmed that one of the two officers stabbed in central London yesterday has been discharged from hospital. The other officer is still receiving treatment. A man in his 20s has been arrested on suspicion of causing grievous bodily harm and assaulting an emergency worker. He remains in custody. Hundreds of thousands of people in Japan have been urged to evacuate their homes amid warnings of unprecedented risks from an approaching storm. A special typhoon warning has been issued as the south of the country braces for the arrival of what could be the biggest storm in decades. Now, with all the sport, here's Ollie Foster at the BBC Sports Centre. Hi, Ollie. Ollie, thank you for that. Ollie Foster there. That's it. These now are the latest pictures from Westminster Hall, and later tonight, the Queen's grandchildren will be holding their own vigil in that hall that will be here on BBC One. But first, time for the news where you are. Bye for now.